Hello and welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. This time I've got a video game for you for review as I take a look at Bioshock Infinite. Since this game is less than a year old as of this recording, I am not going to be going all in-depth in spoilers. Similarly, I'm not going to get into the DLC because the DLC is, well, younger than the game itself. And in this case, when I'm recording, the second installment of the Burial at Sea DLC just came out. So, yeah. So, let's get started. Bioshock Infinite follows Booker DeWitt, a former soldier who who took part in the massacre at Wounded Knee, and who later worked for the Pinkerton Detective Agency before being fired. Or either that or quitting due to objections to some of the conduct that they that the Pinkerton Te Detective Agency engaged in, particularly involving strike breaking. DeWitt is hired to go to the floating city of Columbia to retrieve a girl named Elizabeth and take her back to New York City. If he does this, a considerable debt that Booker has accrued will be cleared. Booker, unlike the protagonist of the first two Bio Bioshock games, is not a silent protagonist. Because of this, he's a lot more developed as a character. He's able to express remorse for his prior actions, and considering the horrible atrocity that Wounded Knee was, along with the things that it's implied that he had to do or did while working, with the P working for the Pinkertons, if the character hadn't been able to express remorse for those actions, he would probably seem like less of a likable character. Does making Booker a verbal protagonist remove some sort of player agency in terms of interpretations of the player of the character and his actions? Yeah. On the, the other hand, though, it gives narrative agency to Booker, I think. Silent protagonists can't because they are silent protagonists, we have no way of knowing whether their actions they make are by choice or by force of circumstance. Um, it's, or, to put it another way, it's, it's the would-you-kindly situation from the original Bioshock. Bioshock. We, as a player, are do as our care, um, we do what other characters tell us to do. Um, we, uh, with side protagonists, you can't have the characters say, I'm going to do this. And then do it because he's not, as he has no way to express a opinion or a desire to do a course of action, unless this is a situation where we're dealing with a silent protagonist who is mute. Uh, as far as actually mute, unable to speak, and thus then can in turn express themselves through hand gestures or sign language, uh, depending on the time period the game is set. However, by um, giving Booker an ability to speak. We really have an opportunity to give the character agency when he does something, he's effectively saying, I am going to do this, as opposed to uh, giving a, getting a mission objective from a third party. Though, you can, though the, the second option, objective from a third party, happens as well. There's a certain degree of Someone asked me to do this, I'm choosing to do it, as opposed to not doing it. Um, and in some cases, the objective, when it pops up on screen, is something that Booker said he's going to do. He says, oh, we need to go do this, and then boom, on screen, objective is go do this. It's clear that this is the objective that Booker has decided, or this is the, the option that Booker has decided to take. So it's it still doesn't give narrative agency to the player, as far as for what kind of character is Booker, what do I, who do I want him to be, as in terms of playing a role. But, honestly, I prefer, given a choice of purely silent protagonist, um, with an option to interpret the protagonist's actions, versus a um, spoken protagonist where I can't easily interpret who the protagonist is, but I can... Um, but the protagonist has agency. Um, I probably split down the middle. Depends on how the, the spoken, the verbal protagonist is depicted. Um, but I'd rather prefer a if I pick between a likable spoken protagonist or a blank slate silent protagonist who I can who I can project myself onto. 
I'll pick the verbal protagonist. This situation also allows Booker and the player to build a better rapport with Elizabeth. Elizabeth, as a character, is a lot like a Disney princess, albeit a Disney princess in the world of xenophobic, militaristic ultranationalists who want to exterminate all life on Earth that isn't part of their chosen people. Sort of like a cross between the Know-Nothings and the Daleks. This leads to an interesting take on the game's world. After being freed from her imprisonment, Elizabeth displays an intense energy and enthusiasm to learn more about the world beyond the walls of her tower, to experience it in a better way than she was able to through the terrors that she's able to open through the fabric of reality. However, this also means that through Booker and her, we see Elizabeth become more disillusioned with society as she discovers the true, ugly, horrible underbelly that lies beneath the surface of Columbia. And so at this point, I should probably talk a bit about the gameplay and what role Elizabeth plays in the gameplay, as actually how you actually play the game. Much like the original Bioshock, you have special powers that you can get that give you special attacks, whether it's the ability to project fire, or the ability to attack with a horde of crows, or whatever. In Infinite, they're called Vigors, and they operate off a separate energy gauge, like with Bioshock 1 and 2. This brings up Elizabeth and how, what role she plays is rather than make this game into a 15 to 20 hour escort mission, which would be frustrating, she is instead kind of allowed to roam around the environment and get stuff for you to help you through the combat situation. If you're running low on ammo, she may find you bullets for whatever your primary gun is or whatever the gun you're low on is. If you're low on health, she'll find you an item to replenish your health. And if you're low on energy for your vigors, which is called salts, you can get you can get those if she finds some for you. Also, when you're not in combat, she may occasionally find some money and toss it over to you that you can that you can then use to purchase additional power ups or restock on health items or replenish on vigors or what have you. Um, so this really helps make the game flow better. You don't have the risk of Elizabeth getting killed out of the blue, sending you back to your last checkpoint, or otherwise basically making you having to play one particular way because you're stuck dealing with however Elizabeth's AI is coded for her to move, thus letting you play how you want to, whether it's long range with sniper rifles or up close and personal with melee and maybe shotguns. And also, it means that while you still have to manage your resources, whether it's health, whether it's ammunition, whether it's your salts for your vigors, you can still... you don't have to focus quite as much. Additionally, Elizabeth has the ability to to use tears in the environment, much like in, in the narrative, to bring things in. In this case, these are things to help you negotiate the environment or negotiate through combat. This can range from finding a or, or creating a box of health replenishing items, or a bo- or a crate that has a weapon that you didn't have before, or in turn activating um, some automated defenses or other autom- automatons that will help you in combat. Whether it's like a chain gun toting um, Abraham Lincoln or George Washington or an automated sentry gun, or what have you. This gives the player a whole bunch of new ways to go through the environments. It lets you create an ally to help you flank a group of enemies, or distra- distract, distract the enemies from you so you can run and go get some health power-ups. Um, or it allows you to create a crate hook or something like that to let you leap up to a higher level, and thus make yourself a little less accessible to enemies, and in turn let you avoid problems with getting flanked, or alternatively, let you get up on the same level of enemy snipers who are taking you on, and thus let you deal with them more equally, or more, on more equal terms. Moving back to the city, the city of Columbia itself is much more of a character in the story than Rapture was in Bioshock. I mean, yes, Rapture had its own unique look with its art deco sensibilities and the advertisements for the various businesses and the... Um, 
as well as having the various characters coming over the um, radio or intercom to taunt you or give you orders to your next mission or that sort of thing. Um, but nonetheless, Rapture was a dead city. Any people that you were encountering were either antagonists, whether like direct enemies such as Splicers or the villains, or maybe an occasional like one or two allies who will provide you information or a resource to help you along the way. Columbia starts out as a living city with people going through their daily lives and living their lives. It makes everything feel, well, alive. It, it gives a sense of depth to the city that Rapture never quite had, because you never really saw Rapture in its prime. Here, Columbia is in its prime, but over the course of the game, it's going to, in turn, have... It's going to fall, metaphorically and literally. And because of this, when this happens, when everything goes bad, it gives you that contrast that you never really had with Rapture. You would assume and imagine that, that Rapture was all pretty and everything before everything went to hell in a handbasket, but here you know, you saw, and to a certain degree, you're directly responsible for it. We also have get a better look at the society of Columbia and what it's like. Um, the kind of sort of steampunk, semi-anachronistic society where, not semi, but very anachronistic society, where on the other hand, you have steam-powered vehicles and all, and yet you're also in a floating city that basically works through the ab abuse of quantum mechanics. And because of the sort of time travel s stuff that's going on, there's bits like, for example, we have a barbershop quartet, quartet that you encounter very early on in the game singing God Only Knows by the Beach Boys. Yet you are not just, like, before the Beach Boys started performing, but prior, you're practically before they were born, as the game starts off in the very early 1900s, like 1915 or so. Um, Additionally, the society of Columbia is very, there's a very stark contrast. The upper class is a very ultra-conservative, very Christian culture, in the sense of thinking of bad-mouthing Christianity, but in terms of, if you're not Christian, you're, you're not going to be part of this upper class. And for that matter, it's, if you're not Protestant, presumably Baptist, you're not part of this upper class. Um, but it's also built around a cult of personality based around Zachary Com Comstock, the main antagonist, and three of the founding fathers, uh, George Washington, Thomas, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin. And he combines this with the societal divide between the upper classes, all, again, basically all white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and a de facto slave class made up of African Americans who are essentially sent up as slave labor, um, Irish Americans, and Chinese laborers. Additionally, there's a side plot in the game with a class struggle between the segregated lower class and the upper class, which climaxes with the lower class rebellion um, called the Vo uh, Vox Populi, or rather the rebellion of the, the working class called the Vox Populi, um, taking control of the city and going on a purge of the ruling class, which draws allusions to various nasty revolutions in history, from the French Revolution, well, not so much the French Revolution, probably closer to, oh, well, Pol Pot. In fact, there's direct direct allusions to the some of the, the, the classes that were executed by Pol Pot's um, military troops. I'm trying, to be, trying to be delicate about this. The game has gotten some flack over this by... Basically, taking a situation that that could have been perceived as being shades of gray, and the group has a complication to their motivations, and making them come across as more directly evil. This had some particular additional flack because of the fact that many of the people involved in the revolution are people of color, um, particularly African Americans and people of Chinese ethnicity, and. I disagree with this in terms of that this shouldn't be in there. Well, um, Ken Levine has gone on record as saying that the depiction of the Vox Populi and their revolution is kind of 
meant to play on the idea of both sides of, and actually for all the Bioshock works, of going, for lack of a better term, going too far is wrong, which doesn't sound like an anvil that needs to be dropped, but occasionally it does. Um, I mean, we have plenty of examples in history of populist revolutions that turn into violent, ugly, horrible things. From the French Revolution to the Communist Revolution in Russia um, to, well, as I mentioned before, Pol Pot. I mean, that, he was a Maoist revolutionary. But no matter Mao. So, I can kind of cut some slack on this. Not all revolutions are as clean-cut as the American Revolution was, relatively speaking. I mean, the, rel the American Revolution had its own really nasty problems, too, um, such as Tory households being attacked and members of the family being scalped and all other sorts of charming things. So, I can kind of cut some slack on this. In any case, as far as my verdict on the game itself goes, Bioshock Infinite made it on a lot of sites' lists for Game of the Year of 2013. Even if it didn't win, when they put together their top tens, or their top fives, it showed up there. A lot. And I can't disagree with that assessment. The game plays and controls very well. And the narrative is very well put together, although there are some issues which I could probably make in terms of for how certain aspects of the time travel works. I'm, o I'm generally okay with it, but I can't really get into what the complaints other people have and address them without getting into spoilers and trying to avoid that. The game is too young for that. We're not outside the statute of limitations. I'd say if you have a system that can play this game, whether a console or a PC, I would definitely recommend checking this game out. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, I'd recommend supporting my Patreon. It will help me upgrade my equipment and hopefully get the show out more often. Um, and if you want to support, there's a link in the show notes. So thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.